friends, subscribe our channel, and press bell icon to get the notification of new video. Thank you. Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. And all the best for this test. The test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. You will hear a conversation between a police officer and a crime victim. First, you have some time to look at questions one to three. Good afternoon. Sussex Constabulary, PC Browning speaking. Good afternoon. I would like to report a theft. Right, madam. First I need to get your details before we can proceed. Fine. Go ahead. Could you give me your first name and surname, please? Yes. It's Mary Tyndale. Could you spell your surname, please? Yes. It's T-I, that's I, not Y, N-D-A-L-E. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Was that an N or an M you said? I know. The line's not good. I said N, not M. OK. And your home address and postcode? 4 Larch Avenue, Park Road, Swindon. Sorry, you said 4 Larch Avenue, as in L-A-R-C-H? Yes. And the postcode is FN1... SW19. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. OK, that's fine. Now you said you would like to report a theft. Yes, my handbag was stolen this morning. Can you describe your handbag? Well, it's quite an ordinary white leather bag with two black leather handles. Oh, and a black shoulder strap too. Any other features you could describe? It's quite plain. There isn't any picture or design on the front. There's also a zip fastener on the top. How about the contents? Did you have any valuables in it? Luckily, no. I left my iPad at home along with my mobile. I'm quite forgetful sometimes. I had a purse in it, though, with a small amount of money, as well as my driving licence. My keys and personal items and so on, I always keep about me in my coat pocket. OK, that's fine. All I need to have is your phone number or other contact number. My mobile number is 07900381988. Sorry, was that double eight at the end? Yes, that's right. Thank you. That's all I need for now. You need a crime number. OK, I'll just get a pen. Ready? Go ahead. So, it's T K. 34S5899. We'll contact you within the week to give you an update. Thank you, officer. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear a scientist giving a laboratory induction to a group of new employees. 
First, you will have time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome everybody to Browning Smith Laboratories. I'll be giving you a short tour around your new working environment and pointing out several key features. It's very much state of the art as I'm sure you'll see. Please now look at the plan of the laboratory building I gave you earlier. At the moment we're standing in the large storage room. It's right there, positioned at the top on your plans and roughly in the middle. We've just come through the entrance door indicated and that's now behind us. OK, so got your bearings? All know where we are? Good, let's continue our tour then and go next to the dry lab. As we go straight ahead down this corridor, the caretaker's room is the next room on your right. Immediately after are the unisex toilets. Now, let's go through these doors ahead of us and into the dry lab. OK, so here we are now in the dry lab, which is the laboratory's biggest work area. If you look at your map, as we are standing now with the doors behind us, you can see the acid storage bin area clearly marked off to your right. Let's walk over there and take a look. You can see on your maps that we're standing in the far end of the building now. The acid storage bins are a hazardous area, obviously. If one of you should accidentally come into contact with not only these stored materials, but any other hazardous substance, then please proceed immediately to the eye wash emergency shower area. That's just back where we came in, right after the doors opening onto the dry lab on the outside corner of the unisex toilets. I think those are the main features this end of the lab, apart from the chest freezer and cooler you see off to your right as you're facing the acid storage bins. The cooler area is divided into two sections. OK, let's go and see the rooms now at the other end of the building. Now don't turn off to your left. That's where we entered the lab, if you'll remember. The next entrance off to your left, however, is the wet lab, which, if you'll look on your plan, is adjacent to the large storage area, but can only be reached by this entrance. Let's pass on by this lab and the clean lab adjacent to it and make our way to the small storage area. It's the first room through these doors ahead of us now. Please hold the door open for the person behind you as we file through. Good. I think that's everyone here now. This is the small storage area. And now we are at this end of the building. There remains for me to show you only one other room. You can see two doors leading off this room. The one ahead is an exit which will take you outside the building. The other leads to the walk-in cooler. Oh, there is one more area I need to mention. That's the walk-in freezer. It can only be accessed by leaving the building entirely either through the exit I just pointed out or the first entrance we came in. I hope that's all clear now, but you will soon become more familiar with the general layout of the laboratory building. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, I'd just like to refer to health and safety procedure. This is essentially to fulfill basic health and safety requirements since I know that you are not unfamiliar with such procedures and must know them off by memory. Okay, so firstly I'd like to say that if you are undertaking any project, whether supervised or not, all of you will be required to discuss it first with your health and safety coordinator. In certain cases, written approval is required. The health and safety coordinator has the final decision in situations where formal approval is needed. Everyone undertaking a project will have to first submit a form of a written standard operating procedure to the health and safety coordinator, outlining the steps and justifications for the experimental process to be carried out. Should the undertaking of a project not be granted initially, plans for the project, if satisfactorily amended, can be re-presented to the Health and Safety Coordinator for approval at a later date. Assuming acceptance of the undertaking of a project, strict laboratory procedures must be adhered to. Overalls and non-hazardous equipment can be kept in the large storage room. On no account can either laboratory clothing or samples be removed from the building itself. Obviously the same goes for equipment that is portable. This way we can ensure that no cross-contamination can occur with samples or specimens kept in the laboratories. Finally, and this goes without saying, when hazardous materials are being handled, full protective equipment should be worn. Safety goggles and protective overalls are kept in the small storage room for this purpose. If using sharp contaminated objects, such as needles, these can be temporarily stored in clearly marked containers on your laboratory work surface. However, they must be disposed of by the end of the day in the waste disposal bins clearly indicated outside the laboratory building. These bins are to be found just outside the exit by the small storage room. In the event of fire, Please make your way immediately to the nearest of the two exits, either by the small storage or large storage room that I pointed out earlier. All that remains for me to do is to welcome you all to the company and wish you good luck. That's the end. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. You will hear a discussion between two students of criminology and their lecturer. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. That was a really fascinating lecture. If a bit gruesome. Well, the Ratcliffe murders of 1811 certainly had a significant impact on English society at the time. It wasn't just the fact that innocent parties were involved or that two households were brutally murdered that provoked public outrage and hysteria. The murderer 
or murderers, since there may, as you know, have been an accomplice, invaded the sanctity of their victims' homes to commit truly horrendous crimes. An Englishman's home is his castle, right? So I guess no one felt truly safe in the comfort of their own home after that. Exactly. That's also why burglaries, too, have such a profound effect on their victims. It's often not the loss of valuables or possessions or even the inconvenience that upsets a victim most, but the fact that their conviction of being safe in their own home has been severely compromised. But public hysteria broke out too, didn't it? Because there was a feeling that public safety was under threat. It was felt that the localised police forces at the time were inadequate. Very true. The police force at the time had limited power. They could enforce the rulings of a local magistrate for the county, but they had one huge disadvantage. There was no communication between county police forces, was there? Yes. Details of crimes committed within a county were not shared. Obviously, when a criminal crossed county borders, they could often successfully evade capture. Today, that seems so absurd. Nowadays, with information instantly accessible to all police forces nationally and worldwide on police computer systems, yes, it does. But don't forget that it was only with the formation of London's Metropolitan Police Force in 1829 by Sir Robert Peel that criminal records could begin to be consolidated on a national basis. Even then, some areas outside, and even within the Metropolitan Police District, remained beyond the jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Police Force. Were the Ratcliffe murders a bit of a wake-up call then to the crime-fighting forces of the time? More than that, they acted as a catalyst in the formation of the Metropolitan Police. The public too played no small part in bringing about the much-needed shake-up in the policing systems of the era. So the Metropolitan Force was founded over half a century before the infamous Jack the Ripper murders? Yes. However, in spite of the Force's best efforts, the Ripper remained at large. Many suspects were put forward, though, ranging from children's author Lewis Carroll through to artist Walter Sickert. Despite the notable failure to deliver justice on this occasion, the Metropolitan Police Force could not be blamed for any inadequacies in police procedure. In fact, the creation of the Metropolitan Police Force was a turning point in English law-keeping. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So once the public got what they wanted, an organised police force, were they happy? One would imagine that that would have been the case. However, the public in fact showed a resentment towards the new law enforcers. Really? Yes, so much so that the public gave them derogatory names like Peelers and Bobbies. Nicknames derived from the name of the Metropolitan Force's founder, Sir Robert Peel. I guess not many people would have wanted to work for the Metropolitan Police then. Well, at least it was full-time paid work. In fact, policing only first became a permanent full-time profession with the advent of Henry Fielding. He formed a force armed with pistols, known as the Bow Street Runners, in 1749, answerable to and paid by a magistrate's office. Prior to that, policing had relied on unpaid night watchmen and constables working for a particular parish. Male householders were chosen for the jobs of watchman or constable, working by rotation or appointment. Armed with no more than a cane, the watchmen were a poor match for the criminals of the day, as were the constables, who were similarly ill-equipped. Those appointed as watchmen or constables, not surprisingly, lacked enthusiasm for their task, which had to be combined with their normal daytime employment. So, did the Metropolitan Police Force operate a tough selection process for employing officers? 
they are with the same conditions for a certain height and fitness level as in contemporary police forces. But when new recruits entered the force, they had to work their way up from the bottom. No concessions were made for class or background. This still holds true today. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You will hear a recording describing a trial courtroom and the conduct of legal trials. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Although variations occur in courtroom layouts, this is a description of a standard UK trial courtroom. In a trial courtroom, the judge is invariably seated behind an elevated desk or bench. Adjacent to the bench are the witness stand and a section that is slightly larger to accommodate the court reporter. Behind the court reporter, the bailiff stands against the wall of the courtroom throughout the proceedings. His job is to ensure the court procedure is observed and order is maintained. Directly in front of the judge's bench, located in the central courtroom area known as the well, is a table where the court clerk sits and records court proceedings. Only the bailiff is authorized to cross the well during a court session to transfer documents between the lawyers and the judge. Any unauthorized crossing of the well is regarded as being extremely disrespectful to the court and is usually expressly forbidden. Off to one side of the clerk's desk is located a table where the defendant and his lawyer are seated. The defendant, also known as the accused, works closely with his lawyer, who is also termed the lawyer for the defense. Across the other side of the courtroom, the lawyer for the prosecution sits with the plaintiff, who is bringing the case against the defendant to court. Close by is the jury box that covers the largest area in the courtroom. It holds 12 members of the public who are responsible for delivering the final verdict on the defendant. All those who are actively involved in court proceedings are in the area of the courtroom termed the bar. Behind the area of the bar is the gallery, which seats spectators who may be relatives of those involved in the court hearing or merely curious members of the public. The bar itself may be an actual physical barrier, such as a railing, or merely a designated area. Apart from the parties to the case and any witnesses, only the lawyers can literally pass the bar. Court personnel and jury members usually enter through separate doors behind the bench. And this is why the term the bar has come to refer to the legal profession as a whole. So that is the court setup.
Now on to how the verdict is arrived at and sentence proclaimed by the judge. When all evidence has been given and challenged by both the lawyer for the prosecution and the lawyer for the defense, then the process of reaching a verdict can begin. Prior to the judge's summing up the case, it is normal court procedure for the judge to meet with both lawyers first. In the meeting, what the judge will say is determined by mutual consent between the lawyers and the judge. It is then up to the judge to decide if the summing up will be split into two parts. If this course of action is taken, the summing up will be divided into a legal part and a summary of the facts of the case. The legal part is basically a clarification of what the charge is and what has to be proven in addition to any special directives for the case such as the need to respect confidentiality. The summary is given to ensure that all members of the jury are reminded of the essential facts of the case. It is an impartial summary of all the evidence heard during the trial by the jury. After the summing up, the judge will stress the importance of reaching a unanimous verdict. The jury will then retire to consider their decision. If the case is particularly complex, the judge will first issue the jury with a written document entitled, A Route to Verdict. This is essentially a series of questions the jury should pose themselves whilst considering the verdict. The time taken for a jury to reach a verdict can vary from a few hours to several days. If there is a chance that the verdict will not be reached before the end of the court day, then members of the jury are free to go home on the proviso that they will not discuss details of the case with anyone outside the courtroom. The more serious the case, the longer a jury may take to reach a decision. If the jury continues to struggle to reach a verdict, the judge will deliver a Watson direction, which is also known as a give and take direction. Essentially, this is a directive reminding the jury of their oath and to maintain unbiased views whilst discussing the verdict. Should the jury not be unanimous in their decision, then a majority verdict is permitted. Once the verdict has been delivered, the sentencing of the accused is left entirely to the judge. The jury is, however, permitted beforehand to influence the judge's sentencing in order to make it more lenient. Accordingly, a recommendation of mercy is added to the jury verdict. Whether the judge takes this into account is entirely up to them. You now have half a minute to check your answers.